turned away when she reaches out Thank to a you, service Senator for help. Waters, your time so has expired. We'll now move to question time. Um, Senator Farrell. Uh, Chair, uh, uh, sorry, President. Um, I have a statement by leave concerning ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Senator Wong will be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business overseas. In her absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, the Minister for Defence, uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister for Defence Personnel and Minister for Defence Industry, in addition to all of my other <coughs> um, responsibilities. Gallag Senator Gallagher will represent the Minister for Climate Change and Energy and the Minister for Environment and Water. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Now move to questions, and I call Senator Little. <laughs> Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. When asked on 28 July 2022 if the government is intending to remove compulsory income management from the Northern Territory, you told the Senate no. The instruments that give effect to the operation of compulsory income management via the basics card are due to sunset this Friday. Can you confirm that the government will not let these instruments sunset this week and will extend the operation of compulsory income management? Thank you, Senator Little. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank uh, Senator Little for uh, that uh, question <coughs> and for her uh, <coughs> deep and uh, sincere interest uh, in this uh, area of uh, policy. Um, when I answered that question uh, <coughs> on the last time it was uh, raised, of course, um, the answer I gave was the, uh, uh, the correct, uh, the correct uh, answer. <coughs> and uh, um, the no, no, we haven't uh, been rolled. No, I don't get rolled. Uh, <coughs> no, I don't get rolled. Um, <coughs> so the. I'm simply making the observation that the statement I provided to the Senate on the last occasion, I think it, uh, um, th that I was asked this question, it was the, uh, correct, uh, the correct answer. Um, I think the, the difficulty that um, <coughs> the opposition is, is having uh, with this whole uh, cashless uh, debit card uh, issue is that there's a lack of understanding that <clears throat> although you had this sort of policy that you're all committed to um, and you believed it was uh, working and successful in the communities that you'd applied it to, all of the evidence that has now come out... Um, um, Minister, could you sorry. resume your seat, please? Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, on a point of order, um, I believe the senator on this side of the chamber was asking a very specific question around the extension of instruments that relate to income management in the Northern Territory. The minister seems to be referring to the cashless debit card, which is not the subject of the actual question. Do you think you could perhaps ask the minister if he could address the issue about the proposed extension of income management via the basics card in the Northern Territory? Thank you, Senator no, Rustin. And, uh, the minister is being directly relevant. He has responded to the question as it was asked. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Thank Thank you, uh, President. And I don't think I could have been more directly relevant or more, more directly answering the question that I was asked. I was asked a question about statements I'd made on a previous occasion in the Senate when I was asked similar questions, and uh, I thought I answered that question as directly uh, as, uh, as it uh, <coughs> is possible uh, to do. And I can't think of anything else I could have said. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. President, there was one question here about whether these instruments would be extended. Uh, if Senator Farrell, who's now taken a minute and 56 seconds, is unable to provide that answer, uh, he should commit to come back to the chamber and do so promptly, given they expire in sunset this week. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Sen uh, the minister was also asked about a question he'd asked previously, and he ha ha is being directly relevant. Uh, please continue, Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, President. Uh, I, as, as I was saying, I Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Little, uh, first supplementary. Good work again. 
can, can the minister confirm that the Albanese government has now had a backflip on your intention to repeal the cashless debit card by introducing amendments to extend its use in Cape York, the Northern Territory, and in a voluntary capacity in the four other CDC trial sites? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President. And once again, I thank. Uh, Senator Little for her, uh, her question and her interest in this uh, in this area. Um, all, all of the places that uh, you've just uh, outlined are places where um, we are making changes to uh, the operation of the uh, the cashless uh, debit uh, card. Um, I think the the first and fundamental point, and again, <coughs> I hate to lecture. Uh, the opposition, but the Labor Party took this policy to the last yeah, election. Yeah. We, we went to the people of Australia, we went to the people of Australia and we said uh, we don't believe that this system of income management that um, you, had, uh, you had established um, in, an ideological, uh, in, in an ideological fashion is working, and we intend we intend to change it, and that's what we're doing. And so today and tomorrow, that's exactly what we're going to be doing uh, in this thank chamber. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Little, uh, second supplementary. Thank you. So the Albanese government has announced 50 million for additional drug and alcohol treatment programs in the CDC trial sites. Does this announcement, along with the introduction of the new amendments, mean the government is finally acknowledging its policy to repeal the CDC will have serious social harm for the communities which rely on it for critical support? Great question. Minister. Um, the answer is no, and I'll, I'll tell you why, uh, Senator uh, uh, Little. Um, in, March, in March 2020, your then government committed $49.9 million in additional funding to alcohol and other drug-related treatments. So you've, you've committed the money, but, but what happened? How much of that $49.9 million was spent, was spent, was spent on, on dealing with alcohol uh, issues in Indigenous communities? Yes, you're right, Senator Brown. The answer is zero. Not one single dollar of that money was spent. Now, the new, the new minister, the new minister, and she's a terrific minister. I know, I know, I know her very well, Senator, uh, not Senator, <coughs> Minister Rishworth. She should be in the Senate. She's doing such a good job. Thank she should you, be in the Minister. Senate. Your time has um, expired. Uh, Senator Payman. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the state of the budget and some of the challenges facing the budget? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman uh, for her question and her interest in all matters relating uh, to the Australian federal budget. Um, when Parliament returns after this sitting week, it will be to hand down the October budget. The Treasurer and I announced last week that we will release the final budget outcome for the 21-22 financial year this Wednesday. And I think we've been very upfront about the serious challenges facing the economy and the substantial pressures hitting the budget. And one of the biggest pressures, of course, is the management of the trillion dollars of debt that was left to us by the former government. With higher interest rates, that debt will now cost the budget more to service, with billions and billions of dollars that we will need to find in the coming years that has not been provisioned for. And that, of course, is on top of the funding that was promised uh, by the previous government for the last financial year that did not get out the door to benefit Australians, and much of which will pass over to the next financial year. Whether it's COVID support, delayed infrastructure projects, support for flood victims, in there, there's at least $6 billion that those opposite promised to spend in the last financial year but didn't, and we will now have to pay for these as they flow over through the October budget. But the Treasurer and I have been very clear that this, uh, the former government did not make provision for a lot of the costs that are going to have to be managed by this government, because this is a government of grown-ups 
This is a government that actually does their work. This is the government that's methodical in our analysis, that weighs up the evidence for policy decisions, that makes those really often difficult decisions when we go through the budget process. That is our commitment to the Australian people. That's why they elected us. They wanted someone to manage the budget responsibly, to be fiscally responsible, but also to make room for all of those areas that Australians value in terms of, of their services and um, access to to support. Uh, Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, can the minister explain how the Albanese government will help Australians deal with cost of living pressures in the upcoming October budget? Thank you, Senator. Minister. And I can. Um, thank you, Senator Payman. We know Australians are doing it really tough, which is why the, our first priority is dealing, delivering responsible cost of living relief. Responsible because it needs to take some of the pressure off people, but also grow the capacity of the economy and not make the Reserve Bank's job harder. A great example of this is our childcare policy, which every member on this side is so proud of, with the legislation being introduced into the House this week. This will be a game-changer for family budgets, for our workforce and for the productive capacity of our economy. And We know what we stand for on this side, rock-solid support for game-changing, economy-building, cheaper childcare. It's a no-brainer. Sure, anyone who is serious about helping with cost of living would support cheaper childcare, and surely if you spend every day lecturing the government about cost of living, you would support that policy as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Um, what steps is the Albanese Labor government taking now that it is in charge of the budget to properly manage some of these major challenges while still delivering on its promise? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman for the supplementary. We've been responsibly assessing and, um, line by line through the budget process about where Australian taxpayers' money is going. We want to ensure that the budget is managed properly, but we are, that we are able to meet our commitments and, of course, manage some of those incoming um, budget pressures. Apart from implementing our election commitments, which are obviously important in terms of our economic plan for Australia, things like cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines and fixing the aged care crisis, but we've also had to deal with issues left behind by the previous government. This includes around $5.5 billion in unavoidable spending. Around $3.5 billion of this was extending COVID relief payments in line with isolation requirements, vaccine eligibility, support for aged care facilities and replenishing medical stop files, all unfunded by the previous government, and around $2 billion in relation to disaster recovery, all necessary funding but you, uh, not the provided has for. Expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Cybersecurity, Senator Watt. On 22 September, Optus confirmed they were responding to a significant cyber attack. Can the Minister outline what steps the government has taken to protect Australians who may have had private data stolen in this attack? Thank you, uh, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Patterson. I know cyber security is a matter you're uh, very genuinely interested in, and I think all Australians were concerned uh, to see uh, this apparent cyber attack that occurred over the last few days involving uh, Optus data. Uh, and I think that's because Australians do expect that when they hand over their personal data, particularly to corporations, that every effort will be made to keep it safe from harm. Uh, and as a result of this data breach, unfortunately, it appears that millions of Australians have been impacted uh, uh, in, a, in an unfortunate way. Uh, as Senator Patterson recognises, the information that we have to date is that the breach involves people's names, date of birth, phone numbers, email addresses, residential addresses and, for some customers, passport and driver's licence numbers being for sale on the dark web. Uh, so this is very concerning, I think, to many Australians. Uh, I do note, however, uh, that Optus has advised uh, that while a wide range of data has been breached, uh, according to Optus, payment details and account passwords have not been compromised. So that is at least some uh, saving grace, I guess, for, for Australians who have experienced this. Uh, since the government was advised of this matter last Wednesday, the 21st of September, uh, a range of government uh, bodies have been working to contain the incident, including the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Australian Federal Police. 
Uh, of course, uh, for obvious reasons, I won't go into the technical assistance and cyber security advice that is being provided to Optus or the wider efforts to help protect Australians. Uh, but I can assure Senator Patterson and all Australians that uh, hundreds of Australian government staff have been working long into the night and over the weekend to stem the damage uh, flowing from this, and I want to thank them for their efforts. Uh, the Minister for Home Affairs has, of course, been continually briefed since this issue commenced, uh, and I note also that the thank Leader you, of the Opposition Minister, was briefed today. Thank you, Your time today. has expired. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I thank the Minister for his answer and for also anticipating my first supplementary question. So I'll move on to my second supplementary question. Why did it take almost three days for the Minister to publicly respond in the form of three tweets sent at three quarter time of the grand final to the most significant cyber attack in Australian history? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, I don't think that is a fair characterisation of the minister's response to uh, this incident. And as I say, uh, a number of government bodies who are directly responsible for responding to these sorts of incidents were involved as soon as they were informed of it by Optus. And, and I'm, I'm assured that the minister herself uh, was continually briefed and worked with those agencies uh, to stem the damage flowing from that. So as I say, I don't think that's a fair characterisation uh, of the minister's uh, performance or approach to this. Uh, she, I am assured and I am very confident that she has done everything that is appropriate for her to do as Minister. Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam President. It is now six days since one of the largest cyber attacks in Australian history has, has occurred, and the Minister is yet to publicly front up to speak about what action the government has taken or when it has taken it, and to detail the actions the government has taken. When will the minister publicly hold a press conference to answer the questions that Optus users and Australians have about this issue? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Well, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Again, I completely reject uh, the premise of Senator Patterson's uh, question. Uh, and in fact, um, any cursory examination of media regarding this subject over the last few days will see that the minister has made a number of public comments about. Uh, this incident, about her concern about it, about the actions that authorities are taking, and about the additional reviews that she intends to undertake in relation to cyber security. Um, please resume your seat, Senator Patterson. Uh, on relevance, Madam President, the question was: When will the minister hold a public press conference to answer questions about this matter? And I believe the minister is being relevant. He has outlined a number of media comments the minister has made, but I'll hand the question back to him. He's heard your comments, Minister. Um, thank you, President. And I mean, I think it's somewhat ironic that we have a member of the opposition questioning this government's approach to cyber security. Because let's not forget uh, that when the opposition was in in power, only one in four Commonwealth entities met the essential eight cyber security obligations in 2021, according to the op uh, audit office. The, the then government, now opposition, released a ransomware bill one year after the opposition released a discussion paper calling for a ransomware strategy. So I think Thank any you, independent the observer would recognise a good performance. Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Women. Minister, Australia now has one of the poorest paid parental leave schemes in the OECD. We're stuck at 18 weeks paid leave with two weeks for partners paid at just minimum wage without superannuation, a pay cut for many working families at a critical moment in a family's life. Meanwhile, the rest of the OECD has overtaken us with the average period of paid parental leave now around 52 weeks and close to full wage replacement in many places. Australians and organisations from across the country, parents, women, unions, employers, are united in their call for a, a more paid parental leave for Australia's parents, especially mothers. This is one of the most common and most united points of discussion at the recent Jobs and Skills Summit, and not a voice was raised against it. When will your government increase the length of paid parental leave? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I thank Senator Pocock for the question and acknowledge her um, deep expertise in, in this area. Um, as, as the question 
or the preamble to the question um, implied. This was an area that was discussed at the Jobs and Skills Summit. Uh, there is a lot of support for extending uh, the paid parental leave uh, system in Australia. Of course, it was a, a scheme that was put in place by a former Labor government because it's Labor governments that, that do these big things, that answer these big policy challenges. Uh, and whilst I'm not here to announce um, any um, an extension of the PPL scheme. I would say that as Minister for Women, uh, it's something that I am looking at uh, closely if, if and when we can make room um, in the budget uh, for this. Um, we're also dealing with significant deficits, significant deficits across the forward estimates. We have a trillion dollars of debt, which I said in my last question is getting more costly to manage, uh, and there are no shortage of very good ideas uh, that the government would like to fund if we had the capacity to do so. I would also say that uh, last week I announced the Women's um, Economic Equality Task Force. Um, on the, that's chaired by uh, Sam Mostyn. It has a great, fantastic group of 13 women. Um, they will be providing advice to government, uh, and I have no doubt that PPL and improvements to the PPL scheme will be a part of the work that, that they do. Um, the former minister responsible for implementing the PPL scheme, Jenny Macklin, is also on that task force, and it came up at the first meeting. So I think there is agreement about the fact that we need to improve our PPL scheme, uh, but the budget is under real stress, and I have to manage those challenges as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, those supporting increased paid parental leave know that we can afford it, and we can afford it now. We can afford to increase the length of leave, the rate of payment, and pay superannuation on it. Rather than give a $9,000 tax cut to the 227 politicians in this building and to the very well off, we can redirect stage three tax cuts to the parents who need it most. Will you set aside the stage three tax cuts and instead improve paid parental leave? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Our position on stage three tax cuts hasn't changed. Um, and I would also say that the amount of good ideas that are coming to the government would more than um, exceed the allocations related to that. I'm just making the point that you, in the Greens policies alone, the Greens policies alone, I think, would have the Green. Sorry, the Order. Greens policies alone would spend that ten times over. Um, on the point of PPL, I genuinely, I genuinely, and the government genuinely wants to look at how we can progress this when we have made, when we have the room in the budget to do so. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. And you mentioned Jenny Macklin in her second reading speech in the introduction of the first the paid parental leave bill in. 2010, she drew attention to the need uh, to pay superannuation on paid parental leave. But here we are 11 years on and no progress on that front. We must make sure that mothers in particular don't find themselves living in poverty after a lifetime of work and care. Why should the price of care be poverty in old age? Will your government ensure that all periods of parental leave are covered by superannuation payments Thank you, Senator so Pocock, that parents your time aren't has left expired, behind? Minister. Thank you, President. And, uh, I look forward to working with Senator Pocock to advance women's economic equality in this country. It is absolutely a priority for this government, as you would have seen in the, some of the policies that we took to the election uh, and some of the uh, ways we raised the uh, level of interest in women's economic equality at the Jobs and Skills Summit. So I do look forward to working with anyone in this uh, chamber who wants to genuinely progress economic equality. Um, and obviously, super on paid parental leave has always been part of, of the discussion. I have no doubt that the Women's Economic Equality Task Force will be looking at this and providing me with advice in uh, the near term. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly. Madam President, my question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Could, you, could the minister provide an update on the progress of the Albanese Labor governments to diversify Australia's export markets? Minister. Thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Polly for her deep and abiding interest in this, uh, in this issue and uh, a, particular, a particular interest to her home state of Tasmania. 
After a uh, decade of the Liberal government, Australia is more dependent than ever uh, on a single market for our exports. Placing all your trade eggs in one basket has proven to be bad economic strategy. The uh, COVID-19 uh, global uh, pandemic, supply chain volatility, which have uh, been exacerbated by uh, Russia's illegal invasion of uh, Ukraine and Chinese uh, trade blockages, have exposed the growing risks for Australian exporters, jobs and prosperity. To address these challenges, the Albanese Labor government is implementing a trade diversification plan that will provide opportunities for Australian businesses to gain new market access into major markets and facilitate inward investment to help build the infrastructure for the green economy. The Liberal government dropped the ball by failing to conclude parliamentary processes to enable entry into force of the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and the Australian-Indian Economic Cooperation uh, and Trade Agreement. Unlike uh, the previous government, the Albanese um, Labor government Minister, is— Minister, please resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator Billick. President, I'm having quite a lot of trouble hearing. And for, for, a, side, for a side of parliament with no policies, uh, I think you, they Senator should Billick. listen. It's not an opportunity but to I make can't hear, I seriously cannot hear Thank him. you. I will ask order, senators. Order. Order. Senator McKenzie. Um, Minister, please continue. And I'd ask senators to listen quietly. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, unlike the previous government, the Albanese Labor government is working hard to conclude all treaty and legislative processes to enable implementation of the UK and India trade agreements this year. Yes, this year. Given the importance, given the importance of implementing these trade deals as soon as possible, uh, we expect support from the opposition benches in both chambers for the expeditious passage of the relevant legislation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Madam President, could the minister provide an update on the progress of the trade negotiations with the European Union? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Once again, thank uh, Senator Polly for her question. Um, despite many years of negotiations, the Liberal government failed to land a trade deal with the European Union. In fact, negotiations stalled as a result of the Morrison's government's disrespectful treatment of a close ally. I'm happy to report that negotiations are now back on track. Last week, I met with the French Trade Minister, and it was a very positive discussion. In the meeting, we reiterated our support for concluding the Australia-European trade agreement negotiations, uh, preferably by early next year. Uh, we acknowledge that an ambitious and comprehensive trade deal would provide an opportunity to boost two-way trade and investment with further strengthen our bilateral relationships. On the same day, I also met with members of the European Parliament's uh, Committee on uh, International Trade. It's clear that the Albanese government's strong commitment Thank to you, address Minister. climate Your time change. Has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. Madam President, the minister recently participated in trade negotiations to launch the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. What is the framework, and how will participation benefit Australia, Minister? Minister. Thank you, President, and once again, thank Senator Polly. Earlier this month, I did uh, join uh, ministers from 13 uh, other partners across the Indo-Pacific in Los Angeles to launch negotiations for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Together, IPEF members represent over 40 per cent of global GDP and, for Australia, eight of our top ten trading partners. At the meeting, it was agreed that negotiations would cover a range of new and emerging issues on trade—supply chains, clean energy, decarbonisation and infrastructure, as well as tax and anti-corruption. Launching IPEF negotiations is a significant step in the future of greater economic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. It brings together the United States, North and South Asian partners, including India, uh, and most importantly, uh, our Pacific neighbour, Fiji. IPEF is an important element of the Albanese Labor government's trade diversification agenda. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts. 
Question is to Senator Gallagher, representing the Minister for Health. Minister, I understand that the TGA is conducting a review of their ban on prescribing ivermectin for COVID. Can the minister confirm this review is underway, state the return date, and advise the Senate of the current advice to medical professionals on the use of ivermectin for COVID-19? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Roberts for, for the question. Um, I understand the TGA received an application from a, a doctor uh, to amend the poison standard in relation to ivermectin, and um, I think that kicks off an automatic process, uh, which the application is to remove those restrictions that were placed on ivermectin uh, when it began being um, prescribed to treat COVID-19. Um, and so the application is to enable uh, GPs to be able to prescribe it. I think that kicks off a process which is automatic in the TGA and the application is currently open for public consultation until the end of this month. Um, and then it will be discussed um, at the ACMS, uh, by the ACMS at their next meeting on the 9th of November and an a decision, an interim decision is expected by February uh, 2023. Uh, and a final decision later in 2023. I understand in terms of advice, whilst this process is underway um, separately, um, there hasn't been any change in advice uh, around from the TGA, which led them to put those restrictions on ivermectin as a prescription for COVID-19, that that hasn't changed. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. On August 31st this year, the Brazilian University of San Paulo published a peer-reviewed paper that found regular use of ivermectin as a prophylaxis for COVID-19 led to a 92 per cent reduction in COVID-19 mortality rate amongst their sample of 88,000 subjects, a 92 per cent reduction in mortality. Minister, how much more proof does this government need to overturn the ban on ivermectin today and stop costing lives? Thank you. Senator Roberts, Minister. Thank you. Well, I have full uh, trust and faith in the processes that the TGA uh, implement in terms of making advice and recommendations um, uh, and placing restrictions, in this case, on the use of ivermectin. I would say uh, that there are, there's a range of um, academic research, not all that would be putting the case as you put it. I've seen other studies that have been done that um, have, show that there is no clinical benefit from using ivermectin. So I think, and that isn't unusual. That isn't unusual in in some of these um, trials. It isn't unusual to have a, a, a significant difference of opinion. Um, but from uh, my point of view, the TGA has served us very well through this um, <laughs> pandemic. Um, they have provided very good advice. Um, their processes are rigorous and thorough. Uh, and this process that's now underway, I'm sure we'll look at the issues that have been raised by this doctor, but as far as I Thank can see, there's Minister, no reason to change. Expired. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Whether separate from or part of a royal commission, Minister, will you conduct an inquiry into the failure of medical advice on ivermectin and specifically who made the decision to ban ivermectin? Who is responsible for the harm that came from that decision? And when will you apologise to the politicians and medical professionals who were right all along? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Thank you. Well, I think we have a fundamental um, disagreement happening here. I do not accept the position that you're putting, um, Senator Roberts. I understand you have a particular view on this, but I believe that the Therapeutic Goods Administration have operated very well during this pandemic. Uh, the Prime Minister has made it clear that at the right time, um, when we're through the pandemic, that you would definitely have a review of some sort into looking at the, our response to the pandemic, uh, but I do not accept the proposition that you're, place, you're putting about the use of ivermectin. Um, the evidence that's before the TGA is that um, there did need to be restrictions placed on it. It's not the only drug where there are restrictions placed on it. There are other medicines that cannot be prescribed by GPs or where they have to go through a process. Uh, but um, based on the information the TGA has provided, uh, they see good reason to put those restrictions on. Um, and that other process, which I spoke of in the first answer, will um, report back on those dates that I've outlined. Thank you, Minister. Senator Henderson. 
Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Since July, the Opposition has been calling on the Government to adopt the Coalition's online privacy bill, which reflects the urgent need for greater online privacy protections on social media and other platforms such as those run by telecommunications companies. What steps has the Government taken to prioritise these reforms? Thank you, Senator. Minister Farrell. I uh, thank, uh, <coughs> thank uh, Senator Hender Henderson for uh, her uh, question in this, uh, in, in this important topic. And of course, it's got that extra element of uh, importance uh, as a result of uh, the cyber security threats that we saw uh, <coughs> last uh, week, and, week and over the weekend uh, in respect to uh, Optus. I think um, the starting point for a discussion about this, and uh, I think this is what uh, we've discovered uh, <coughs> is that uh, how little um, the previous government did in this space right. and that the problems that uh, we've now inherited are problems because um, uh, we... Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Point of order on relevance. It's a very specific question that I asked. What steps has the government taken to prioritise the reforms in the online privacy bill Thank you, proposed Senator by Henderson. the coalition? I don't need the question um, repeated. I've taken uh, notes of the question. I believe the minister is being relevant, and I'll continue to listen to make sure the elements of your question are answered. Minister. Um, well, look, I, I was trying to explain that the reason that we need uh, uh, need uh, legislation in this, uh, in this space is, of course, because the previous government did nothing about it. And I <coughs> noticed uh, Senator Hume's comments uh, over, the, uh, over the weekend, where she said, we don't have policies, we are in opposition, not in government. And <coughs> I think what's now very clear is not only does, does the opposition not have policies in opposition, uh, they minister, never had any policies minister. in government. Please resume your seat. At Senator Henderson. Uh, a, a point of order on relevance. I would ask um, the senator to be relevant to the online privacy bill and whether the government is Thank you. taking any steps to prioritise these important reforms. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Minister, I'll just refer you back to the question that was asked by Senator Henderson. Thank you. Uh, President, um, look, the Albanese Labor government is committed to protecting Australia's personal information. Uh, the ri rise of the uh, digital platforms and the use of modern technology has created uh, a whole host of uh, new privacy challenges and risks that we saw over the weekend, <coughs> including the collection and the use of a vast amount of personal information by social media platforms. Australians should have better control over how <coughs> their personal data is collected and used and uh, confidence that when they engage with a business or a government agency, their data will be protected and not misused. Uh, and, uh, Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, first supplementary. The Optus cyber attack must surely be a wake-up call about the urgent need for greater online privacy protections. Isn't it the case that the government has been asleep at the wheel on both the need for the online privacy bill and broader reforms of the Privacy Act to which the coalition committed when in government. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister Farrell. Senator Henderson, you can't be serious about ask. You cannot be serious about asking that question. You cannot be serious about asking that question because for ten years, for ten years, including time in time when you were in the lower house, for ten years you did nothing about this issue, and of course we find that the uh, issues uh, that occurred last week with, uh, with Optus have occurred in a set of circumstances where there is no legislative protection um, based on all of the years, all of the years you had to uh, deal with it. Now, we do intend to uh, protect Australians' privacy. Yeah, we do intend to protect it. Um, I might point out to you, Senator Henderson, we've only been, we've only been in government for, uh, for, for, for a few uh, for a few months, you had ten years. You had ten long years to try. You had ten long years. You had ten long years to 
Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. I'm just going to wait for quiet, Senator Henderson, before I uh, invite you to ask your second supplementary. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you, Madam President. As part of the former government's consultation on the online privacy bill, Optus argued that telecommunications companies should be exempt from tougher online privacy laws. More broadly, Telstra and Optus also argued against consumers having the right to erase their personal data. Does the government agree that telecommunications companies Order. should be exempt from tougher online privacy laws? Uh, I'm not going to call the minister until there's quiet. Minister. For that protection. <laughs> um, um, look, I doubt whether Optus is uh, running that uh, argument uh, today, Senator uh, Henderson. But can I say this? The Attorney General and the Attorney General's Department uh, has ex engaged extensively with experts, community organisations, businesses and privacy advocates on his proposed uh, Privacy Act. And the Department uh, so far, <coughs> and I'm happy to provide these to you, has provided two consultation papers. It's received 434 submissions and held a series of uh, round tables. So I don't think... <coughs> um, um, Senator Henderson, please wait until you're called before you... So please go ahead. Uh, a very specific question I ask. On relevance, does the government agree that telecommunications companies should be exempt from tougher online privacy laws. Thank you, Senator Henderson. I do believe the minister is being relevant. Minister, please continue. I started out my, my answer, uh, Senator Henderson, by, by saying that I doubt very much whether uh, Optus is uh, now pursuing that particular, uh, that particular argument. Well, I've explained to you all of the things that the Attorney General is doing in order to consult with all of the, all of the relevant organisations. Uh, so Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, my question with minimal notice is to Senator Watt, representing the Attorney General. Uh, former Senator Rex Patrick is in, the federal, is in the federal court challenging the Information Commissioner for unreasonable delays in dealing with freedom of information reviews. These delays impact everyone trying to get answers from the government. While in opposition, now Attorney General Mark Dreyfus provided an affidavit supporting Patrick's case. Despite this, under the now new Attorney General, the Commonwealth continues to oppose the case. As at 1 August 2022, the total external Order. legal costs incurred by the Commonwealth in opposing Patrick's case were a whopping $301,667.12. Consistent with the sworn affidavit of now Attorney General Mark Dreyfus, and noting that some matters remain unresolved more than a thousand days after referral, will Labor now support the case of former Senator Patrick to prevent unreasonable delays in dealing with freedom of information reviews? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, uh, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge, for the question. I appreciate the advance warning of the question as well. Um, the well, that's common courtesy. You might Order. want to learn a little bit of that. Order. Um, I always displayed common Order. courtesy to you through opposition. Maybe you could uh, do the same. Watt, interjections across the across the chamber are disorderly from both sides. Order, <laughs> Minister Watt, please continue. Goodness. Thank you, President. Um, the uh, Senator Shoebridge's question goes to uh, legal action undertaken by former Senator Rex Patrick. Uh, who I think all of us would recognise made a bit of a name for himself here uh, in the accountability arena. Uh, I understand from Senator Farrell that now Mr Patrick, former Senator Patrick, is running for a Lord Mayoralty in South Australia. So I presume that he'll bring the same level of uh, accountability to that role should he be successful. Uh, in, in direct answer to the question, uh, this matter, as you have recognised, is currently before the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment. Uh, but there can be no doubt whatsoever as to this government's commitment to transparency, in contrast to the abhorrent and willful ignorance of transparency that we saw for 10 years under the former government. Uh, we, we, are, we are on the verge of introducing legislation to introduce and establish a new National Anti-Corruption Commission. I, I see Senator McKenzie welcoming that, and I wonder why 
It didn't happen for any of the 10 years that she and her colleagues were in government. Uh, perhaps one day we can talk about that outside the chamber and she can uh, illuminate me on that. But that is just one example of how this government intends to be far more transparent about its actions uh, than what we saw for 10 years under the coalition. Uh, and as I say, this, this matter before the AAT will be resolved, and that's the appropriate forum in which for us to discuss this matter. Senator Shoebrick's first uh, supplementary. Well, we're talking about transparency and taking you at your word, Senator, that you're committed to transparency. Well, can you now provide an updated cost of how much this case has cost the Commonwealth to today? It was 301,667 fighting transparency as at the 1st of August 2022. How much has been spent to date? Thank you, Senator Shoebrick. Minister. Thanks, President, uh, and thanks, Senator Shoebridge. I can absolutely uh, assure you that I'm happy to provide that information. I will have to take the details on notice. I don't have that figure at hand, uh, but I will take that on notice and um, get back to the Senator ASAP. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Well, well, it gets worse because in a recent letter to the Attorney General, the Information Commissioner said her office was underfunded and revealed that in 2020-21, the now 667 Freedom of Information reviews were more than a year old, increase of some 50 per cent in that year. Would you agree, Minister, would you agree that any funding for the Inf Information Commissioner might be better spent not in court arguing against someone suing against unreasonable delays, but instead staffing the office to respond thank on you, time? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I well remember Senator Shoebridge uh, the resourcing difficulties that the Information Commissioner had over the period of the former government, because on a regular occasions I asked the Information Commissioner about exactly that matter in Senate estimates when we were in opposition. Um, and it was disgraceful the way that the former government starved the Information Commissioner of resources in the way that it did. Now, already though, today, every question we've had from the Greens. Uh, as has been the case in other settings as well, calls for this government to spend more money. And we have to take, we have to recognise uh, that we have inherited a complete financial mess from the former government. Earlier today, you were asking us to spend more money on pa paid parental leave, a worthy thing to do. Now you're asking us to spend more money on information commissioner, a worthy thing to do. I'm sure your next question will ask us to spend $11 billion on something else. We will weigh up all of those uh, things Minister Watt, uh, and, and Minister make the commitments Watt, that we can afford to do. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Shoebridge. This question wasn't about additional funding. The minister's not been um, responsive to the question. This question was about instead of spending uh, it on lawyers, spend you. it on the information commissioner. Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. The minister is being relevant. You've got one second left. Have you finished? I refer to my earlier answer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Can the Minister please update the Senate on recent rain and subsequent flooding recorded in central and northern New South Wales and in the Gold Coast hinterland? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Sheldon, for the question. And can I thank Senator Sheldon publicly for the tremendous work that he is performing as the government's special envoy for disaster recovery, a new position that was created by this government in recognition that our disaster affected communities need all the support that they can get. Uh, and I personally thank Senator Sheldon for visiting around a dozen communities in the short time that he has uh, held this role and providing excellent advice to both me and the government more generally about what those communities need. Uh, I think all of us have noticed that over the last week we have been closely monitoring and responding to another difficult weather system, particularly over central west and northern New South Wales, as well as some severe thunderstorms in southeast Queensland. The worst of the flooding over the weekend was in the Namoi River in Gunnedah, with several streets, low-lying properties and businesses inundated. And I know that all of our thoughts go out to the communities that have been affected, particularly through New South Wales. There were also strong fears that Lismore would again see localised flooding, but fortunately forecasts there were downgraded. The Wilson River, which of course runs through Lismore, only peaked to minor flooding levels, this time well short of the level required to top the flood levy there. I want to commend the New South Wales SES services, uh, both paid and volunteer personnel, for the tremendous work that they did to pre-deploy resources to affected areas 
and to assist vulnerable people who were still recovering from the last floods earlier this year. The action that the SES took in getting ready for these events before they hit, I think, go, went a long way to ensuring that people were kept safe. As of late yesterday, the New South Wales SES had received 898 requests for assistance, including 64 flood rescue activations. Uh, and of course, South East Queensland was also affected, particularly the Gold Coast hinterland. Sadly, this flooding has taken the life of a young five-year-old boy in Tullamore in New South Wales after the car he was travelling in was swept away by floodwaters. Again, I know that all of our thoughts go out to that family, and that's another reminder of the life-threatening danger Watt, your that floods time has provide. Expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Can the minister remind the Senate of the weather outlook for this summer and advise how the government is preparing for these potential disasters? Minister Watt. Senator Sheldon for the question. As I've previously told the Chamber, the Bureau of Meteorology has officially declared a La Nina event for Australia, with above average rainfall predicted for most of the east coast of the country this summer. Given that this will be our third successive La Nina event as a country, something that I'm advised is incredibly rare, the risk of flash flooding and severe flooding is even higher than we have seen previously. That's why it's vital that our emergency management agencies are working to their best ability to make sure that we are prepared. Earlier this month, I formally launched the National Emergency Management Agency, or NEMA, bringing together the capabilities of Emergency Management Australia and the National Recovery and Resilience Agency into a single agency. NEMA brings together the capabilities of both agencies to provide support, prepare for future disasters, lead the response when disaster strikes and remain deeply connected with communities during recovery. Last week, I announced Mr Brendan Moon as the new Coordinator General of this new agency. Brendan is one of Thank Australia's you, foremost Watt, natural disaster professionals. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister outline what else the Australian government is preparing for communities for these potential natural disasters? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. As I've said before, good governments plan for the best and prepare for the worst. That's what we've done in establishing a new agency, in appointing one of Australia's foremost disaster professionals to head it, and taking additional action as well. It's why teams from NEMA have been out meeting with all states and territories to discuss their preparedness plans well ahead of this high-risk weather season. The briefings included a scenario-based discussion based on the bomb outlook to better understand the risks and enhance collective preparedness for the upcoming season. But how we respond to natural disasters must not just be about the immediate response. Last sitting, this government introduced amendments to the Disaster Ready Fund legislation, and these amendments will ensure that the full $200 million allocated in the fund per year is spent on disaster mitigation while maintaining our commitment to support communities as they recover from disasters. And we've also been rolling out important funding in New South Wales under the Emergency Response Fund for disaster mitigation projects. It's what Australians deserve, and it's a far cry Thank from you, the Minister, I don't hold up. Your time up has expired. Senator McKenzie. Fine, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister guarantee that the Albanese Labor government will put an end to the uncertainty faced by farmers and transport operators and restore the fuel tax credit scheme? Minister. Order, Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you. Oh, Senator Still. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, I'm not aware of. I, I think the question was, are you going to restore the fuel tax credit scheme? Um, I'll have to take um, that on notice, President, and come back to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. National Road Freighters Association President Rod Hannafee says it all comes down to cost of living, and I quote, road transport is at breaking point. Drivers and operators can't keep footing the bill for rising fuel costs. Not all can easily pass these costs on, and it simply adds to the cost of living across Australia. It's unsustainable, and supply chains will soon grind to a halt if this new federal government doesn't step in. When will the minister give industry and the Australian community certainty, given the fuel excise is due to be reinstated from Thursday this week? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Madam uh, 
President, uh, and I will come back to the chamber if there is further information I can um, provide. Um, obviously, we are going through a range of uh, decisions at the moment uh, through the budget process, um, and I would also point out that the budget is in a terrible state, right. as I've been trying to make clear all in all rules. of the public statements I've been making rules. about the budget, is 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 that we, whilst there are a whole range of things and a whole range of stakeholders who would like us to invest more, to spend more, and to support them during um, some of the increases that, that co in costs that they are experiencing, um, we have to we have to balance that with the fact that. You guys busted the budget. Like you, you doubled the debt before the pandemic. You doubled the debt before the pandemic. You failed to fund ongoing programs that are ongoing, Thank and we you, will Minister. have to Your deal with that. Your time has expired, Senator McKenzie. Our second supplementary. Thank you. The TWU, ARTIO, NRFA, and Nat Road have all written to the Treasurer, calling for certainty. Rising operating costs are already impacting the sustainability of road transporters, drivers and operators who already operate on razor-thin margins. Industry groups and unions are in lockstep on this issue. When will this Labor government stop sitting on their hands and restore the fuel tax credit scheme? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Order. Order. Is that a policy? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Well, I've already undertaken to come back to the Senate if there is further information that I can provide. But the government is currently weighing up a whole range of different requests uh, and challenges facing the budget. We are going through that process now. And whilst there are a whole range of areas Order. where people want us to invest more or respond to a particular challenge, we have to deal with these matters in a fiscally responsible way. That is the government that we are going to be, and if there is anything further that I can provide, um, President, I will come back to the chamber with it. Thank you, Minister. Uh, senators, um, the Minister has the right to respond to the question uh, in silence, as does the person asking the question. I ask you to show some respect. Senator Urquhart. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline the latest details in the government's plan to deliver an Indigenous voice to parliament? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Urquhart for the question. Uh, as senators would know, the Albanese government has committed to implementing the Uluru Statement uh, in full, and we will hold a referendum to enshrine an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in the constitution in this term of parliament. This will be a once-in-a-generation opportunity to recognise our First Nations people in our founding legal document and to make Australia a better place for everybody. Because no matter what side of politics you're on, I think we can all agree that something needs to be done, and as a country, we can do better. The Voice is about making a practical difference. It's about addressing poor outcomes from the long legacy of failed programs and broken policies by listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about what works. The government will this week convene the first formal meeting of the referendum working group. This group will provide advice to government on the big questions that need to be considered in the coming months. Firstly, the timing to conduct a successful referendum. Secondly, refining the proposed constitutional amendment and question. And thirdly, information on the voice necessary for a successful um, referendum. Uh, Senator Farrell. We're trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to listen to uh, the issue of the- uh, uh, Order, the order, order. Senator Farrell. Order. I would ask all senators to listen to the response from Minister Gallagher in silence and not. Uh, Senator Nampajinka Price, in particular, you have been disorderly throughout her response. Um, please continue, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Um, thirdly, the information on the voice necessary for a successful referendum. Its work will be complemented by the establishment of a second group, the Referendum Engagement Group that will be tasked to build community understanding and awareness for the referendum. Uh, 
The groups comprise a broad cross-section of representatives from First Nations communities across Australia, and they will ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander views are front and centre in the decision-making leading up to the referendum. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Urquhart, first supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Albanese Labor government's commitment to delivering a voice to parliament will make a difference for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I'm very happy to answer that question. A voice to parliament will be about hearing from the grassroots, from the community, about what can be done better. It's a direct line to parliament to make a practical difference in areas like um, housing, keeping children in schools, in education, in health, in infrastructure, in community safety. It's about local communities finding local solutions to local problems. And the idea of a voice came from those communities. It's about ensuring First Nations Australians are heard, that they're heard on policies, that they're heard on laws, that they're heard on what works. And I would encourage everybody in this chamber to get involved in the discussion, even if you disagree or have a difference of appointment, and work together to bring about this nation-building change. Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart, second supplementary. Can the minister outline to the Senate why a voice to parliament is important for all Australians? Minister. Thank you, um, Madam President. And I thank Senator Urquhart for the question. Well, it's about respect, really, isn't it? It's about respect. Um, it's about listening to Order. First Order. Nations people. It's about Senator ensuring Rustin. that our constitution recognises the longest continuous living culture in the world is reflected in our country's constitution. Our, our founding document is reflected. That's what it's about. Everyone wants to work together to make Australia a better place, and that's why all of us have a role to play in this debate. It is about talking to friends. It's about listening to what's being proposed, even if you have a different view, but being part of the discussion. It's not a radical proposal. It's a fair and practical change, and I urge everybody to Thank get involved you, in the discussion. Thank you, Minister. Time has expired. Senator Farrell. Oh, President, could I ask that further questions be put on, uh, on notice? Yes. Thank you. And I also uh, have a further response to Senator Little's uh, question of uh, Thank you. myself. Um, I'd like to add some additional information to the answer I provided to Senator Little on the topic of income management. While income management legislation in the Social Security Administration Act of 1999 does not sunset, it operates through a number of legislative instruments that sunset every 10 years. These instruments enable uh, income management to operate in specific locations uh, and or um, income management measures. Six of these legislative instruments were due to sunset on the 1st of October uh, 2022, and I think that's what you were <coughs> referring to. In order for the government to consult effectively with communities on the future of income management, the Attorney General has agreed to deferral of the six instruments for a period of 12 months. Our consultation with communities will then uh, direct the future of income management. Product level blocking technology <coughs> Product level blocking technology will be maintained under our government's plan to support participant and merchants under the Enhanced Income Management Program. It will reduce the stigma associated with the business card under the current Income Management Program. Senator Birmingham. President, pursuant to Standing Order 74.5, which requires that questions on notice be answered within 30 days, I, at the request of Senators Cash and Bragg, seek an explanation from the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why answers to questions on notice numbers 98, 126, 127, 128, 129, 139, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, 
202, 203, 204, 205, 254, 255, 256, 257, 289 and 326 have not been provided within the requisite 30 days. That's a very good question. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, well, Minister Birmingham would know something about unanswered questions on notice. After all, he was the minister representing the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, as recently as just a few months ago. And can I tell you the number about the uh, uh, former uh, Prime Minister's track record on questions on notice? When the election was called, the former Prime Minister had a total of 128 unanswered parliamentary questions on notice. 128. And it wasn't, it wasn't just parliamentary questions on notice that were left unanswered. The Prime Minister's own department had a total of 391 unanswered questions on notice from uh, Senate estimates. 391. <coughs> I am advised that the Prime Minister will answer these questions in due course, but we are not going to be lectured by the opposition after the government routinely failed to answer questions on notice in a timely fashion. Senator Birmingham. Deputy President, I move to take note of the answer provided by Senator Farrell. Well, Depu Deputy President, we were told it was all going to be so much better. We were told they were going to hold themselves to a higher standard. We were told endlessly, of course, how terrible the previous government were, and we heard Senator Farrell attempt to do that just again. But it turns out, Deputy President, that it was all just talk. It was all talk from those opposite that, indeed, there are 22 overdue questions on notice from the Prime Minister alone already. 22. Senator Farrell likes to remind this chamber that the previous government was in office for nine to ten years. Now he comes in and says, and there were 128 questions that were overdue from that time frame. Well, you've only been there, as you like to remind us, Senator Farrell, for some few months, and yet you've already racked up 22 to the Prime Minister alone that are overdue. It was all talk. You have broken your promises to this chamber. Let's look at what some of those promises were. Senator Watt, Senator Watt said just last year in June, we deserve answers and transparency. It is not negotiable and it should not be negotiable for the Prime Minister to comply with the standing orders and properly answer these questions. Well, why then is it that Mr Albanese, through Senator Farrell, is now trying to negotiate? around whether or not he complies with the standing orders in terms of answering these questions. Remarkably, Senator Watt was still going on with some of these claims, even in question time today. He said, there can be no doubt whatsoever as to this government's commitment to transparency, in contrast to the abhorrent and willful ignorance of transparency over the years under the former government. Well, apparently there is doubt as to this government's commitment to transparency, despite what Senator Watt was saying in question time today, despite the fact he claimed that adhering to these standing orders was not negotiable, the government is walking away from them. Of course, it's not just Senator Watt. Senator Ayres, Senator Ayres indeed, reflecting directly upon me in the role Senator Farrell just referenced, Senator Ayres said back in November 2020, it is high time Senator Birmingham signalled a change in approach in terms of accountability and ministerial accountability in this place from what we have seen in a stoic refusal to provide timely responses to questions on notice. So Senator Ayres was there with Senator Watt arguing for timely responses. Now here they are lining up the excuses. Senator Mariel Smith, in quite an honest and reasonable contribution very early on in her time here, said, I am relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions are answered within 30 days. That presumably is why the standing orders are there, within 30 days. Labor senator after Labor senator used to say it should be within 30 days. Now, of course, they're failing in that regard, even those no longer with them. 
It's always nice to reflect on former Senator Keneally. <laughs> Even those no longer with them. Senator Keneally, who could put things very directly. Standing orders require the government to answer questions on notice and to answer them in a certain time frame. It is not a technicality to avoid accountability. It is your responsibility as a government to be answerable to this chamber. It is the responsibility of the government to be accountable to the questions posed by senators, and it is your responsibility to, co to conform to the standing orders. The standing orders require the government to answer questions posed by senators, including on notice. Various Labor senators, present and past, arguing very clearly that they believed questions should be answered within the time frame of the standing orders and that they would hold to a higher standard in that regard. This is a government that knows how to grandstand. We can see that from everything. They know how to grandstand, but they are already showing themselves to be incapable in the delivery. Grandstanding, yes. Delivery, no. Because guess what, Deputy President? It's not just the 22 questions to the Prime Minister that are overdue. There are, in fact, 117 questions to the new government that are already overdue. 117 questions that have been racked up that the government has got sitting in various places that already they are determining is not possible for them to answer. So despite all these grand claims that we have seen about answering questions on time, this government has shown itself to be hypocritical in that regard. And they're not just hypocritical in terms of this area of accountability. There are numerous areas of accountability in which this government is showing that it is not living up to the rhetoric that it took to the election, to the rhetoric that it deployed in this chamber previously, or indeed to the claims they still try to make about themselves. Take the ministerial standards. The ministerial standards unveiled with great fanfare by the new prime minister a new ministerial code of conduct. And yet then it became apparent that his ministers hadn't either read the code of conduct or ensured compliance with the code of conduct. Because subsequent to the unveiling of the code of conduct, which came some time after the ministers had been sworn in, the ministers were sworn in, then the code of conduct was unveiled. You would assume ministers had been informed of it before it was publicly released. You'd certainly hope that's the case, Deputy President. Then subsequent to that, three ministers at least have been forced to change their interests after it was publicly revealed they were in breach of the new code of conduct. The NDIS minister, Mr Shorten, the local government minister, Ms McBain, the assistant trade minister in this place, Senator Ayres, all had to go through and make changes after the public disclosure of their breaches to the Code of Conduct. So a government big on rhetoric about accountability, big on rhetoric about transparency, won't answer its questions on time in this chamber. Its ministers have been found to not be reading or not complying with the Code of Conduct. Or indeed we had the issue raised by the Australian Greens in this chamber today, the issue about National Cabinet release of documents. Back in opposition, the, op the Labor Party constantly complained about the secrecy surrounding deliberations of National Cabinet. Mr Albanese and others endlessly attacking and suggesting that former Prime Minister was, and I quote, obsessed with secrecy over these issues. And yet, and yet, now, Mr Albanese has confirmed after his first National Cabinet meeting that the Commonwealth has not proposed changing practices in relation to the release of documents from National Cabinet. And as you heard from the questions of the Australian Greens today, not only are they not proposing changes, uh, but they're continuing to defend the decisions of the former government. Now, I'm not, Deputy President, necessarily criticising their decision in that regard. It's the hypocrisy that I'm shining a spotlight on, the hypocrisy uh, of a mob of Labor politicians who endlessly criticised the former government and railed against the former government in relation to the way it handled such matters of release of information. And yet then, when it comes to office, simply 
goes and continues past practice, ignoring all that they had to say before. They are the living embodiment of hypocrisy in the way in which they are conducting themselves in this regard. We see it in chamber management too. Chamber management here in terms of, again, a government that used to rail against the application of guillotines, mm -hmm. complain about curtailing of debate, but now has been more than happy to do so whenever it suits them, and not just in this chamber, but even more remarkably, what they've done in the other place, Deputy President, in the other place where they have the numbers to be able to simply change the standing orders, they've done that. And they've done that basically embedding a permanent gag and guillotine yes. in the standing orders sure. of the House of Representatives. So much for debate in the House of Representatives, so much for empowerment of the greater diversity of members of parliament in the House of Representatives. It now basically just takes a minister to declare that legislation is urgent. Done. They don't have to give any reason. They don't have to say why it's urgent. They don't have to meet any other criteria in relation to its urgency. The minister just says it's urgent, and then all of a sudden a range of automatic guillotines take effect. That once declared urgent, a bill in the other place is subject to automatic guillotine. The changes collapse the consideration of the uh, consideration in detail phase of the debate in the House of Representatives meaning that any amendments, government or otherwise, are simply moved together, voted on immediately. Deputy President, that's not a government committed to transparency. That's not a government committed to accountability. That's not a government committed to the proper functioning uh, of a parliament. That's the behaviour of a government that simply wants to drive through its own way without any consideration for transparency, accountability or the proper functioning of government. What we see with those opposite is that despite all the grand and lofty promises they made during their years in opposition, despite all the great criticisms that they tried to deliver, they ultimately are failing to live up to those standards. Now, Mr Albanese, even when he was releasing his code of conduct for ministers, claimed that they were committed to integrity, honesty and accountability and that ministers in his government will observe standards of probity government and probity and governance. Well, Deputy President, where is the integrity and accountability when ministers breach the code of conduct None. and have to have it called out by the media, be shamed publicly into changing the way their affairs are ordered, and then try to deny that there was actually anything wrong? Where are the standards when you have a government that claims endlessly that it's frustrated in the delivery of answers when they're in opposition, moans endlessly that the then government was failing to adhere to the standing orders, promises endlessly that they would do better, but then when it comes to their own behaviour, within just a few months has racked up 117 overdue questions. 117 overdue questions across a range of different areas of public policy. The 22 that I highlighted today to the Prime Minister were questions asked by my colleagues Senator Cash and Senator Bragg across different issues in relation to superannuation industry policy, different issues in relation to workplace relations or in relation to the administration of government. They're not particularly tricky questions, Deputy President. These at the early stages of a government you would think are relatively straightforward questions for a government to get on and answer. So how, why is it the case that this government has been unable to do so in the time that they have had? 30 days they've had these questions, and yet the clock has seen them run over and fail to do so. 117 across all of the other portfolios. So, Deputy President, let it stand that this government is a government proven to be one who was just all talk when it came to these sorts of standards pre-election, and now they're breaking their promises to the chamber, to the Australian people, to themselves even. No doubt they'd convinced themselves going into the election, and now they're breaking their promises to themselves as well. They're a government who will no doubt continue to grandstand and claim that they're doing better, that they're doing differently, when in fact the proof is in the data, the proof is in the behaviour that they are letting themselves down, they're letting this chamber down, and ultimately they're letting the Australian people down. 
Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, transparency, integrity and accountability. This is the Prime Minister of Australia, the man who went to the last election stating that if he was elected by the Australian people, an Albanese-led government would be the hallmark of transparency, integrity and accountability. And yet today what we see is Mr Albanese has fallen over at the very first hurdle. And in providing an explanation on behalf of the Prime Minister of Australia, what did we get from the minister representing the Prime Minister? Well, actually nothing. Nothing but excuses and blame. You see, what the minister and the Prime Minister clearly fail to remember, you are now in government. You set the standards by which you wanted the Australian people and this parliament to judge you. Transparency, integrity and accountability. And yet on each one of those standards, with 117 questions overdue, and it's not like you had a short time in which to provide the answers, this is overdue now for over 30 days, you have failed in every regard. And as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate stated, when those in government were on the other side of the chamber, they were very demanding when it came to questions being answered on time. And yet now, now that they are in government, they don't hold themselves to that same standard of accountability. In June last year, just over 12 months ago, what did now Minister Watt say in relation to the failure to provide answers to questions on notice in a timely fashion? He said this, we deserve answers and transparency. He went even further actually and said, it is not negotiable and, and it should not be negotiable. At that time, for the then Prime Minister to comply with the standing orders and properly answer those questions. Well, of course, that Prime Minister is now his Prime Minister. That Prime Minister is Prime Minister Albanese. And according to what now Minister Watt said at the time, Mr Albanese has failed. Mr Albanese has decided that transparency is negotiable, even though when they were in opposition and we were in government, it was not negotiable. And then, of course, Senator Mariel Smith, on the 15th of October 2019, what did she say? I'm relatively new to this place, but it doesn't really seem like an unreasonable request to me that these questions are answered within 30 days. Well, I agree. It is not an unreasonable request, in particular when you are the now Prime Minister of this country and you have gone to an election on the basis of integrity, on the basis of transparency and on the basis of accountability. The Prime Minister should stand true to his words and ensure that at all times he complies with the standards that he himself set. The Prime Minister made a huge fanfare, a huge fanfare when he announced what he said was his new code of conduct for ministers. What did he say in the foreword to the Code of Conduct? Signed personally by Anthony Albanese, the now Prime Minister. He says Australians deserve good government. The Albanese government is committed to integrity, honesty and accountability, and ministers in my government, including assistant ministers, will observe standards of probity, governance and behaviour worthy of the Australian people. And yet, when it comes to ensuring that they comply with the standing orders in this place, the Australian Senate, all of that goes out the window. And the now Prime Minister thinks, well, I won't personally observe the standards of probity, governance and behaviour that are worthy of the Australian people. And in making all the fanfare that he did, 
in relation to his code of conduct at clause five, accountability. He says this, ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office and of the activities of the agencies within their portfolios in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of parliament or a parliamentary committee. Now, Deputy President, this is the code of conduct which Mr Albanese made great fanfare when he announced it. This was going to be the code of conduct to end all codes of conduct. And yet what we have is the Prime Minister himself. And they've only been in government for what is it now over 120 days, and he is already failing the code of conduct that he himself signed off on. But what is worse, as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate has stated, the Prime Minister has been more than happy in the past to have several press conferences about the ministerial arrangements of the previous government, and yet when it comes to taking responsibility for his own government and answering questions, very serious questions, he is nowhere to be seen. The questions on notice, and there's 117 that are outstanding, which have been asked of this government, in particular in this case, asked of the Prime Minister of Australia, are very important. And in, in the case of the questions on notice that are outstanding for me, they seek to inquire into what discussions Labor ministers and the Prime Minister's office had with a number of union stakeholders. Ah. Exactly. But Senator Scar, as you would know, many of these stakeholders have donated millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Australian Labor Party. Money comes in by way of donations, policy goes out. Exactly. There's one accord in town, and that's the accord between the Albanese Labor government and the union movement of Australia. And then when we deign to ask very simple questions, just some what, when, where, why and how, we are treated with complete contempt. And in treating the opposition with contempt, the Albanese government is treating the Australian people with contempt because the Australian people deserve to know the answers to these questions. But again, of course, we know the contempt with which the now Prime Minister treats his code of conduct. He says in a big press conference there's a new code of conduct. All his ministers will abide by it. And yet what do we see? Within the first few months of the parliament, we see minister after minister in potential breach of the code. As I said, what the code actually says is ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office and of the activities of the agencies within their portfolios in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of parliament or a parliamentary committee. And what do we have? Minister after minister after minister ignoring this code. And what does the Prime Minister of Australia say? The Prime Minister of Australia, who went to the election on the basis of transparency, integrity, accountability and honesty, well, let's be honest, he really doesn't seem too interested in whether his ministers are actually abiding by it or not. In relation to one of the first ministers to have a conflict, Minister Christy McBain decided the best way to divest herself of a number of her shares was to actually give them to her husband, oh. which was unfortunate. Which was unfortunate because if you actually read the ministerial code of conduct, it actually says that is a breach of the ministerial code of conduct. You actually, even have to read it. It will exactly, Senator Scar. In this case, she clearly didn't read it. She clearly didn't read it, albeit I understand all ministers were actually issued with a copy of the Code of Conduct. Perhaps Mr Albanese didn't give them the instruction that they should also read the Code of Conduct, because had Ms McBain read the Code of Conduct, she would have understood that you can't just transfer the shares to her husband. What did she say and what did Mr Albanese say? Nothing to see here. No breach of the Code. There has been nothing that has been done wrong. 
Then you had the second minister, Minister Jed Kearney. She had an interest in a fund which had a number of holdings in a fund with significant exposure to healthcare, despite having a portfolio in that area. But again, according to the Prime Minister, who's big on transparency, integrity and accountability in the lead up to the election, when his ministers are called out, there is nothing to see here. But of course we have the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus. Mr Dreyfus, who loves to lecture, and we saw it in question time today actually, was Senator Shoebridge's question, who loves to lecture others on integrity. He refers people to the police. He does frivolously, frivolously referred nine of his political opponents to the Australian Federal Police just to get a headline, because none of these referrals were in any way successful. But Attorney General Dreyfus, for the Hansard record, was heavily invested in a fund which owns shares in Omni Bridgeway, a company which put out a press release, and you can go online, you can Google this, go online and see this, praising a decision by the Attorney General in regards to litigation funding policy, a policy which strongly benefits that company. On any analysis, whether you're a minister in the Albanese government or not, how the Attorney General of Australia would think this is a good idea is quite frankly unbelievable. And he's the attorney. But when and he is the attorney, he should know. Well, he should have read. He should have at least read the kind of conduct. When he was questioned about this in the Parliament, though, he actually said to the Parliament. As he was reading his answer, it's fascinating to actually watch. If you actually go online and watch the video, as Mr Dreyfus is reading out the code of conduct, you can actually see his face. And he realises he actually needs to report back to the parliament on the matter. But this is very, very typical, colleagues, of the Albanese government. What's good for the government when they're in opposition is not the standard that they are going to live by when they themselves get into government. When you look at the fact that this is the Prime Minister of Australia who has failed to answer very simple questions. In terms of the statistics, over 16 per cent of questions in the Senate are currently overdue. 16 per cent of the questions asked are overdue. One months, would think months. three months, and one would think that when you are elected on a platform of transparency, integrity and accountability, no questions would be overdue. But it gets worse, because when you break down the 16 per cent, over 40 per cent of that 16 per cent are actually overdue, and they were directed to the Prime Minister ah, of Australia. He has only been asked 48 <laughs> questions on notice. And yet he thinks this parliament, this Senate, is beneath him to respond. And as I said, if you treat the opposition in this place with contempt, you are treating the Australian people with contempt. The Australian people who believed in transparency, integrity and accountability are being failed miserably by the Prime Minister of Australia. Transparency, integrity and accountability. Those are words in the lead up to an election which the Prime Minister is happy to throw around. But when he gets into government, when it gets into government, it all goes out the window. Senator McGrath. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read out the, the relevant clause from the, uh, this new, new ministerial code of conduct that's been in for several months when I say new. And it says at 5.1, ministers are required to provide an honest and comprehensive account of their exercise of public office and of the activities of the agencies within their portfolios in response to any reasonable and bona fide inquiry by a member of the parliament or parliamentary committee. Now, it is somewhat shameful it's somewhat shameful that we have a prime minister in this country who goes around lecturing us all about good on integrity and about transparency, but also about good manners. This prime minister is big, big about oh, we've got to have good manners in public life, and we've got a good manners when it comes to trying to to change things. But when it comes to answering questions, the prime minister 
doesn't have any good manners. Uh, the good manners have got in a, a big, large, large white car, gone to the airport and flown off overseas with him. And this is the problem. We've got a Prime Minister who's not engaged in the day-to-day -day running of this country. We've got a Prime Minister who doesn't want to answer questions. So 40 per cent of the questions that have not been answered in this chamber come from the Prime Minister. That is 40 per cent. So this is a Prime Minister who spent the last three years going around the country uh, like some sort of demented robot talking about transparency and accountability and how he's pure than pure. Oh, and he grew up in public housing. Isn't life terrible? But I'm going to be honest and transparent. But he gets into power. He gets in that big white limo. He gets in that leather spin around chair and he goes, well, Bugger this. Uh, thank you, Senator Hughes, for that um, um, eloquent um, uh, Senator quite McGrath, Senator McGrath, let's just keep the standard of yeah, well, I, I at a high level. Hughes. She's leading the Australia as, as she is want, want to do. So, and as the Prime Minister is leading the country Australia. But 40 per cent. Now, that is, that is a big number. But when it comes down to it, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy President, there's 22 questions. Now, the so the Prime Minister doesn't want to answer these questions. But I'm going to read out these questions, and I think it is important these questions are more on the public record so those poor people up there in the public gallery can leave this chamber and they go to the Queen's Terrace Cafe and have a, a double shot cappuccino just to make sure that they understand that the Prime Minister of this country is snubbing his nose at this chamber, snubbing his nose at accountability. Now, the first question put, um, from my, my good colleague Senator Cash here, question I noticed number 139, um, says, on what date did the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet provide an incoming government brief to the Prime Minister or his office following the May 2022 federal election? That's a pretty simple question. Like it's it's a classic machinery government. So it's very, very easy. So, so what was the date? So we weren't asking him to do sort of algebra. We weren't asking him to solve uh, uh, come with world peace. It was what date did you get the incoming brief? Now not too tricky at all. And, and this, this you know what answer he gave? None. No answer. None whatsoever. None. No, 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 no answer. Um, and also, we did ask, can a copy, or Senator Cash asked, can a copy of the incoming government brief prepared by the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet be provided? Well, no answer. None. Zip. You know, nit, nothing happened there. So a very, very, very simple question. Now, the next question, in my view, is also very simple, uh, and, and the answer will shock people too because there isn't an answer. And so, my, my, my good friend here, Senator McCarthy Cash, uh, asked the Prime Minister, with reference to the additional information provided by Minister Watt on 28 July 2022 at 3:05 p.m. So very precise, ladies and gentlemen, very, very precise. In, refer in relation to questions taken on notice from myself being Senator Cash, in relation to a meeting held with the Construction, Forestry, Maritime Mining and Energy Union Construction Division on 17 June 2022. The meeting. the meeting. So very, very specific question. It wasn't like a random question like when was the last time you had a scone or something like that. This was a specific question in relation to a, me in relation to a meeting, in relation to a question that was, uh, was asked. By, 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 uh, by my, my good friend here, that, uh, that, that, that Minister Watt sort of didn't really answer, um, but it was 3:05 p.m. So this is like an Agatha Christie. We we know where it happened. We know the time. So question one was: Can all briefing notes, file notes, emails, and messages, including text messages and messages sent on any instant messaging service, all application between the Prime Minister and or his office in relation to the meeting with the CFMU on the 17th of June 2022, the meeting? and or in relation to the Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022 announced by Minister Burke on 24 July 2022 be provided. This request covers both internal and external documents in the Prime Minister's office and department. Now, a pretty specific request. It wasn't what you'd call like a fishing exercise. Senator Cash, you know, hadn't done a done a general question. You know, you know, what's your what's your view on the weather? No, it was a specific question in relation to a meeting, in relation to information that that referred to that particular meeting. So guess what? Zip. Absolutely nothing. Very, very disappointing. Then, 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 then Senator Cash, you are living this at the moment because you are standing up for. 
and you are standing up for the taxpayers of Australia, those poor, poor people who that mob over there are about to take away their stage three tax cuts, by the way. So breaking news there, that's not going to happen. We can all see that coming down, coming down, down the hallway. But can copies of any correspondence between the department and the Prime Minister's office about this meeting, including but not limited to email, instant messages, for example, test messages, WhatsApp, etc., or by letter be provided? So, so we have asked for this on behalf of the people of Australia, on behalf of the taxpayers of Australia, but also weirdly, and, and I don't want to be sort of existential, um, um, Mr. Mr Deputy President, we've actually asked on behalf of the Prime Minister, because the Prime Minister has talked to all of us about the importance of transparency and accountability. We just lectures us like he's one of those who could bore for Australia about this, but he just does, because he's one of those people, he's a, he's a bit of a chatterbox, but he doesn't deliver, and he certainly hasn't deli delivered on this. And what we want to do. We want the Prime Minister, because we were team players, we're team players. We want the Prime Minister to do a good job. We want the Prime Minister to deliver on his promises. We want the Prime Minister to be that man he promised to be for the last three years. Now, we all know, now let you in a secret, we know he's not going to do that. We know that he is a creature of the socialist left of the Labor Party, and there's going to be taxes going up, new taxes. There's going to be there's a giant vacuum cleaner over regional Australia at the moment, sucking all the money out of that so it can go to building trams in Redfern or something like that, as important as trams for Redfern might be. But we have a Prime Minister who is not doing what he said he would do. He is not standing up for accountability and transparency. Now, I am going to read another question now. So, um, so for those who are watching in the office, um, you know, watching at home or watching in the office on the internet, you know, don't make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Just yep. sit down, and you are you just hold on. It's like a roller coaster. Here it comes. So, so. Senator Cash um, asked the Prime Minister again, you know, the Prime Minister, you know, St Anthony of, 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 B, of accountability, transparency and you know, telling the truth. Um, so Senator Cash, question on notice number 197, said, with reference to the additional information provided by Minister Watt on 28 July 2022, it's 3.05pm, uh, in relation to questions taken on notice from myself, that's been Senator Cash, in relation to a meeting held with state and territory ministers with responsibility for workplace relations on 5 July 2022, the meeting. So very specific time, very specific meeting, and look, it wasn't like a meeting just with one person. It, this was with other ministers. So other ministers representing other jurisdictions, all paid for by the taxpayers of Australia. Uh, you think there would be some accountability here, but uh, no. So question number one, was the Prime Minister or his office aware of this meeting? If yes, when and how did they become aware? So you'd think the Prime Minister said, look, look, I'm not the most technological person in the world, but I can go to my Microsoft Outlook and I can sort of you know, do a search and whatever and look backwards and find out when I had meetings and things like that. So it, it, you don't need to be a Rhodes Scholar to operate Microsoft Outlook Diary uh, and find out when you may have had a meeting or not had a meeting. So, and I, there are a lot of people who work in the Prime Minister's office. We see them. They all walk around this building rather grandly and push me out of the line at Aussies and things like that because they're very important people. Um, but I think one of them could actually work out how to use Microsoft Outlook and find out that did the Prime Minister or his office become aware of this meeting on the 5th of July 2022? So, I sort of don't know what they're doing in that office. Like, 40% of the questions have not been answered. Uh, they're paid for by the taxpayers of Australia, and we've got some very simple questions. Yeah. Just, 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 I don't know what they're doing. So we haven't got an answer in relation to that. So question number two, did the Prime Minister or anyone from the Prime Minister's office attend this meeting? If so, who and what position do they hold? So, ask at morning tea. No, well, what they could do, they could ask at a morning tea. They like what we know. They brought back in the morning tea. They're big on morning teas. Uh, they bring on, you know, big on like having lots of biscuits and things like that because that's how you rebuild the economy. But what you think is they could have done an all, all of office email? Yeah, we see that. They just say, by the way, did anyone here know about this meeting? Uh, you know, whoopsie, someone forgot to go. Like my bad. So you think someone would have done that? But no, because they are welcome. Welcome to the new paradigm of of the arrogance Show. of of this this this. And it is a new government, yeah. four months, but it's actually they are the government. Yeah. Breaks my heart to say that. I workshop my pain, but they are the government. They are in charge. But guess what? They're not really doing anything because they're not answering questions. Now, question number three, that my, my good friend Senator Cash asked is. Um, 
if the Prime Minister or his office did not attend the meeting, was the Prime Minister or his office briefed on this meeting or the outcomes of this meeting? If yes, A, when and by whom, and B, what was the Prime Minister or his office told? But these are not difficult questions. You know, we're not saying you know, work out world peace. We're not saying um, work out pi and sign and things like that without using a calculator. We're saying, did you attend a meeting? Was there some information in relation to this meeting? Was there a briefing note? Because we know, guess what, Prime Minister's office? We know there was. We know there was. So by not answering these questions, you're not just lying to us, you're lying to yourselves. And we want you to be better. We want you to be, be proud to spend the taxpayers' money and do a good job. We know, we know you won't, we know you're terrible, but at least try and answer these questions. So question number four. Can copies of any correspondence between any minister's office and the Prime Minister's office about this meeting, including but not limited to email, instant messages, for example, text messages, WhatsApp, etc., or by letter be provided? Well, apparently not, because apparently there is only one photocopy in the Prime Minister's office, and that's on the blink because they're waiting for Terry from someone to come and, from Canon to come and fix it up. Because this is the issue. You know, the, the, the printers aren't working, you know, they need to put a password or something like that. They can't print these things off. Photocopy is not working, and they're not going to, they don't trust Richard Miles and going to you know, borrow his photocopy or anything like that. They certainly won't trust the senator. So they're in trouble. Uh, I'm not going to ask uh, Minister Plebisek either. either. So, so what is going on at the Prime Minister's office? What are they doing in there? Like, more, having an afternoon tea probably right about now. And you know, question, question five is, can a copy of any correspondence or briefing notes from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet or any other department about this meeting, including but not limited email and instant messages, for example, text messages, WhatsApp, etc., or by letter be provided? No. Nope. Apparently not. No. It's, you know, it's, it's a no. It's like it's, there's no answer whatsoever. It's sort of like that awkward silence. You know, they're, they're frightened that people are going to talk to them. Uh, they've got a personality disorder, and they're just going to go and stand in the corner and stare at the wall. That is the political. What we're facing now in politics in Australia is a prime minister's office who do not want to engage uh, with taxpayers. They do not want to engage with this chamber. They do not want to engage with with being honest and transparent and accountable. And that is the lesson here, uh, fellow senators, that we've got a prime Prime Minister's office, who quite frankly don't care about this chamber. They do not care about accountability. We've got a, a government here who do not care about us. So estimates is going to be interesting. So yeah, get, get lots of coffee for that. Yeah. yeah, it's coming down. It's coming down. Oh, Minister, not my job. Uh, Senator Watts. Yeah, yeah. So Minister, uh, Minister Watt is very scared of Shane Stone. Bring back Shane Stone. Yeah, that, that, that'll scare. That'll scare him. That'll scare him. But. Uh, Deputy President, um, it is very important as, 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 as people who believe in a liberal democracy that governments are held to account. And on a daily basis, when we were in government, we were held, held to account by the opposition. And that, and that is important. And as someone who's worked around the world in various different um, emerging democracies, it is so important for that government of whatever persuasion to be held to account. But what we are seeing here is a government who are refusing to be held to account because they're refusing to answer simple questions about how we are, are spent, how they are spending money and how they are making decisions on behalf of the Australian people, but re refusing to release pretty basic information, and that that is shameful. So shame on the Prime Minister. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, and, and you know, kudos Senator McGrath for going through some of those questions. But I don't even think you really touched on my personal favourite of the questions that has been asked. Uh, because I'm actually reasonably sure, whilst this question was asked of the Prime Minister, I'm even going to give him credit. This is probably not something he was personally responsible for. But I am reasonably confident that these details are able to be provided pretty easily, pretty quickly, by his EA, by anyone in his office, because I know when I have hosted a function, all of these details are immediately available. So, uh, following on, from Senator McGrath, the question asked by my good friend Senator Michaelia Cash to the Minister representing the Prime Minister on the 25th of August 2022. Uh, there, actually, this question was asked twice. Question on notice number 289 and question on notice number 326. With reference to any functions, official or unofficial receptions or other events hosted by ministers, assistant ministers, or their departments in their portfolio since 1 June 2022, 
Can the following information be provided for each function? A, the name of the function. B, list of attendees, including departmental officials and members of the ministerial staff. C, function venue. D, itemised list of cost. E, details of any food served. Uh, F, and this is my personal favourite, details of any alcohol served, including brand and vintage. And G, details of any entertainment provided. Because we know that those opposite have never seen a trough deep enough to get their snout in as quickly as possible. And I'm sure that those briefs, which would actually be sitting in someone's drawer already sorted, because that's the sort of information you get every time you host any sort of function, particularly in Parliament House, all of this information is provided to you. Certainly the name of guests. You do not turn up to a function as a backbencher in the opposition without knowing who's going to be at events. And there is no way the Prime Minister is turning up at any function, nor any of his ministers or assistant ministers are turning up at any events without a list of all attendees. That would just be part of the event brief. But any event that they've ordered and they've organised would have all of that information. And I have no doubt that one of the reasons they don't want to provide this, because none of this information has been provided, because the vintage moet that they probably served may not align with the alleged blue-collar working values that they purport to support. The fact that that snout has dolved into the trough well and truly within the first, if you know, I'd like to say 120 days, I would have given it 120 minutes and they'd have been in. Within 120 minutes, the taxpayer-funded French champagne would have been provided. I mean, aside from the fact they don't even support Australian winemakers, except Senator Farrell, we've got to give him credit for the godfather. That's why they dined at Otis. The Otis group was only there because the only restaurant in Canberra to serve Senator Farrell's own wine. So we know Senator Farrell has an interest in the domestic wine market, particularly when it's supporting his own winery. But I think in any other instance, we know those opposite and those particularly at the far left of the chamber love a good drop of a vintage French. But of course, these are the people who are all do as I say, not as I do, who we've been listening to bleat on about. They were going to be the bastions of integrity, the bastions of transparency and honest government and lifting the standards. There were going to be no more mean girls. Everyone was going to be giving each other big hugs or kumbaya. There wasn't going to be the tearing down. It was all going to be about support. It was all going to be love-ins. Uh, you know, I've got a two-minute statement tomorrow, and we've actually just lost a member of uh, a long-standing member of the Liberal Party, so I'm, I may give credit to him tomorrow. But because what I was planning to come and do was actually just read out some of the misogynistic tweets I've received in the last seven days, because I actually thought it'd be interesting to see how the tone of politics has improved since the Albanese government has come in and called for this kinder, kinder parliament. Because I can tell you, it has got worse. And not only has it got worse for conservative women, not only has it got worse, I mean, I've got to tell you, there is a meme that's come out today and it's hilarious. I mean, I think it's great. It's, it's me, Bronwyn Bishop and Prue McSween, and it's asking where's the factory that produces these? And as I said to reply to it, well, that must have been in response to who are your dream dinner party guests. Uh, but you know, then I got another one that was has Bronwyn Bishop and John Howard had another had a love child with a very flattering photo of me, which I sent to former Prime Minister Tony Abbott because we know he always claimed to be their love child, and he responded to me going, "Well, congratulations, the family's clearly expanding." But I digress. We're now talking about the tone, the parliamentary tone. But I'll tell you where we are going to see a tone towards women absolutely descend. And we know where women are going to be starting to be treated even worse than conservative women in this place and in the sewer of Twitter, etc., will be on work sites around this country. Because we know those opposite are all talk, but all delivery when it comes to union policy. As soon as John Setka gave you the call, as soon as those election results were in and John Setka was on the phone, you lot, quick as a flash, quick, let's get rid of that ABCC. We've got to get rid of any security for women on building sites. We've got to get rid of any security for workers on building sites that don't subscribe to the CFMEMU. 
Oh, we know how many, we know how many hearings there's been, how many cases there's been, how the CFMMU just sees these fines as the cost of doing business. The most appalling treatment of women on building sites. But we also know that we hear them bleed on about cost of living. There's a housing shortage. We need to boost the building sector. But how's this going to help? We're going to see building companies struggle even further to attract workers, to maintain workers, to keep their workplaces going and work sites operating, as the unions are given even more overreach and power. And this is only going to get worse. And if you don't think housing costs are going to increase, if you don't think building costs for businesses and, and uh, commercial properties are going to increase, you guys live in la-la land. You guys, everything you do, you're making a bad situation worse. You add to inflationary pressures through every decision you make because you don't understand consequences. You just think, oh, well, we'll do what Mr Setka tells us and everything will be OK. No, it won't. Building, yeah, building costs are going to go sky high. We're going to see inflation follow through. We're going to see further pressure go on families trying to find housing. It's the same as what you're doing with the CDC. And you know that because you've now put $50 million more into drug and alcohol services. You know that there are going to be consequences for Indigenous families, particularly women and children, but you won't ever acknowledge it. You're just going to crawl back under some rock and pretend you don't know what's happening. Because over there, you don't understand consequences. All talk, no action, unless your union bosses tell you it's OK to do so. Absolutely appalling. But we do know that you're very big on action if it comes to photo shoots. We do know you're very big on action if it comes to overseas trips. Because interestingly, we're all back this week and we've got people here in the gallery. And what they don't understand, potentially you may not know, there was absolutely a number of weeks that we could have come back to make up for the week that we had with the Queen's passing. But no, 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 the new Albanese government who claimed they were going to be family friendly, all about work, family, work-life balance decided, uh, with very short notice, they were going to put the first sitting week on the first week of school holidays. They also put the public holiday on last Thursday. Now, why was it last Thursday? Lots and lots of people wondered. Well, what a lot of people don't know is that Friday in Victoria, there already was a public holiday for the AFL. And today there's a public holiday in WA. So Thursday kind of worked because Mr Albanese was back from overseas and other, you know, and so didn't upset the Victorians because they didn't lose a public holiday, didn't upset the West Australians because they didn't lose a public holiday, but upset an awful lot of businesses, but also upset a lot of families because all of a sudden, my case, I had a daughter, I had to come home day early from boarding school. You had parents had to find something to do with their kids on the Thursday to send them back on the Friday for the last day of school. But what you don't know is Mr Albanese, who's so big about transparency and getting through all this legislation, He's not even here for the next two days. So why he's picked this week to come back when we actually have another four weeks that we could have used to come back? Because there are so little sitting days that you have allocated, that the Labor Party has allocated so few sitting days and pulled all the dates back because you cannot face the scrutiny. You will not answer the questions when they're put on notice and you do not like the transparency. You will keep us out of parliament as often as you can, because you do not want to answer the questions. I mean, that is so obvious in this place, with four ministers only in the Senate, and clearly your ministers in the other chamber not providing substantial briefs, because all we ever hear from ministers not my job, or I'm not the minister for, that never washed when, it was on, when we were sitting on that side of the house. I can tell you, I remember watching a number of my colleagues sitting here coming in with their folders, Hilariously, you could barely see them. I mean, thank goodness we had COVID because they had the seat next to them was empty for about the 19 folders that they had, which, you know, in the case of Michaela, I think required about Senator Cash, about six staff to carry them because they probably weighed about four times as much as she did. But that was because we had staff that had effectively briefed her, that had provided information so that when those opposite were sitting on this side of the house and questions were asked, we could answer them. Our ministers were briefed even if it wasn't their direct portfolio responsibility, they had done the work. They had been briefed and they understood under this system of government, they have responsibilities for ministers that sit in the other place. So they could answer the question. As Senator Birmingham could answer the questions when he was asked representing the Prime Minister because he had been briefed. 
What we hear in this place when we ask questions to the Prime Minister, well, I, I don't even know what we hear. I mean, if anyone could tell me what some of those words were today, I'm not 100 per cent sure. There's no answers. There's a killing of time and in, you know, an inaudible amount of waffle, and then you kind of get a bit of a mumble. I mean, absolutely nothing that makes sense to anyone that would be listening at home with those sentences that would have passed the most basic of English exam. But yet this passes somehow for an answer from a minister in the Senate from this government. You know, this government comes in here and is talking to us about how they are this fantastic government, 120 days, they've done so much, achieved so much, talked about their job summit. What job summit? Like, they've talked about a job summit. They came into government with the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. And it wasn't a job summit that you needed to find work for people. You need to find the Labor people. And when you make people unsafe on workplaces, when you put the unions back in charge who represent 10 per cent of the workforce but give them 33 per cent of the seats, when you've got you know, over 50 per cent of Australians employed by small business yet you give small business one seat, one seat at the table, how do you think you're going to actually attract the Labor? You're not. All you are doing is working to detract Labor. You are working to do everything you can to deter people from wanting to go and work in these industries because they will be bullied. They will be harassed. They will be intimidated. And the CFMMU will look at that and go, that's all right. It's all par for the course. That's all right. We'll pay for it. It's all good. We still get what we want. And our blokes are in there now who we give millions of dollars to, and they'll just continue to deliver what we want. So you lot, you're all do as I say, not as I do. And very, very soon, the Australian people are going to start to see through it. <laughs> Senator Reynolds, um, are, you are you seeking the call on the motion moved by Senator Birmingham or taking note of answers uh, um, without notice? Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I'm actually seeking to take note of answers at question time. Just bear with me for a moment. I'll put the motion that uh, Senator Birmingham has moved. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Reynolds, please uh, move Thank your you motion. very much, uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note uh, of questions answered from uh, Senators Little, Patterson and Henderson during question time today. In response to a question from Senator Little, Senator Farrell said some of the most disgraceful things I've ever heard in this chamber, and he said so with a little smirk uh, on his face, as if it was somehow funny what he was saying. Senator Farrell said that uh, the repeal of the cashless debit card was an election commitment, so therefore they had carte blanche to implement it. What he didn't say, what he did not say either publicly in the policy document or subsequently in this chamber, is the following. He didn't say that there was no policy associated with this. There was no detailed consideration of the impact on Australia's most vulnerable. It was simply an ideological uh, left-wing policy statement, one that has unbelievably se serious consequences for Australians, for some of our most vulnerable Australians, particularly women and children and the elderly. Anyone who has taken time to visit these regions will see uh, what the consequences of this will be on at-risk communities. As I've said, they are women, elderly and the children. They are not necessarily about at all the person who has the card. It is about their behaviours um, that will impact again on women, children um, and, and the elderly and those who are also subject to humbugging. It is the view of those of us on this side of the chamber that this card should be extended and not repealed. So what the minister, while she said that they had consulted, it was very clear that she had not consulted and ever since she and her department have been scrambling to try and do some um, very inadequate uh, um, consultations and get input from those on the ground. This parliament, as I've said previously in this place, the Senate very shamefully cut 
put through a consultation, a parliamentary consultation that didn't go to many communities, didn't give time for consultations, and did not visit Western Australia, our home state of Western Australia. So let's hear what some West Australians in the communities who requested this card, who requested this card, have said. So Ian Trust, the director of the Wunan Foundation in Kununurra, he said this. The card reduced the alcohol violence and the harassment of the elderly and vulnerable for cash when they go to use the ATM. The cashless card is not a silver bullet, but it is something that and we can build on it. But there is no plan by those opposites about what happens after the CDC is abolished. We are left in a vacuum. The government says if we want to go down that path of keeping income management, that it has to be a community decision. But there is no information for the communities about how they want us to arrive at that decision or what the replacement will be. Shame on them. The second location in my own home state of Western Australia, the mayor of uh, the city of Kalgoorlie, Boulder, has said this. It seems that the cart has been put before the horse by Labor. The decision to abolish the CDC has been made without any consultation with the regional community, and the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder remains unconsulted on the transition, which will impact on CDC participants, social service providers, government agencies, and the community. And I will also say to public health providers who have to pick up the mess of women and children who are assaulted, who are raped, and who are murdered by men in their own communities. So, after we pointed all of this out, the, co the committee from this parliament did a very, very short um, inquiry. And the government, what did they do? So the minister put out for three days consultations by the uh, impacted uh, local communities. So as late as the 30th of August, the 30th of August, the so-called hastily put together CDC engagement team sent the Goldfields a raft of draft engagement documents, in fact four documents, and they had three working days, three working days for a local council to deal with one of the biggest and most serious issues in their communities. They sent a draft engagement plan, an engagement summary, a participant checklist and a CDC fact sheet. Well, what a triumph of bureaucracy over genuine consultation with impacted communities. And the shires were given until 12 noon on the 2nd of September, three working days later, to provide their feedback. This is a disgrace. And those opposite, they know what the consequences will be in local communities. You Thank cannot you, say you were not Senator warned Reynolds, that people will die. Has expired. Uh, Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And look, I rise and make my contribution to this debate too. And like your good self, uh, Senator and uh, Chair, that uh, there are a lot of people in this uh, building that talk up a lot about closing the gap and working in Indigenous communities. But I know from the heart there are a number of us that actually walk the walk and talk the talk. And uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, you're one of them and I'm one of them. And Mr Acting Deputy President, for those out there who don't know, you and I are both co-patrons of the men's shed in Fitzroy Crossing. Indeed. And I know the work that you have done working with communities around this issue. It's a very complex issue, but it's also very, um, it can tear families apart, it can tear friends apart. It hurts my heart to have this debate because it's a well-known fact in this building that I supported Ian Trust and Lawford Benning and, and Teddy Calton in Kalanara when they worked to do the trial in Kalanara and Wyndham. And, uh, and I remember with um, previous Minister Jenny Macklin committing to the trial. And there was an air of hope around that this would go a long way to, as you and I both know, trying our best to, to and let's say it as it is, stop the rivers of grog that were flowing through the Kimberley. And I'll make this very clear, I only speak about the East Kimberley. I'm not here to represent Kalgoorlie Boulder's view because I've not worked out there. I've done an incident inquiry there early in the piece before it came. But the work that you and I have done through the East Kimberley and through the central Kimberley and the west Kimberley where the card is not there. Mm. Unfortunately, at the time, there was great support for the card. There really was. And it breaks my heart because of the work that I still do in the Kimberley and nobody, nobody, not even Senator Thorpe who likes to have a cheap crack, who's not here today, a cheap crack at us white privileged men. What would we know and what do we do? Well, 
you and I, we've got the runs on the board. And to this day, I still do my community work through the Kimberley. I still run the donated furniture and the bedding for the victims of domestic violence and, and anyone else and the homeless. And I'm doing a run next week again with donated gear. And it breaks my heart when I see kids, same age as my grandkids, and there is no one known they're getting fed three meals a day. It breaks my heart when I'm driving through Fitzroy Crossing and I see the kids, I've seen the footage of the kids trying to break in to the Coles Express to get the Bowser off so they can get petrol to sniff. And I know the argument that I had to have with great support from Coles Express, they were tremendous. Viva Energy weren't very good at all, but fortunately now the fuel both there and at Nali Roadhouse, the 97 per cent's gone. So we've lost the sniffable fuel, thank goodness for that. But it tears me apart to see how the heck can we make these kids' lives better? When I see kids going through Fitzroy Crossing, walking from Bayulu, Mr Acting Deputy President, you know where that is, you've been there like me. 14 kilometres walking in the middle of the night because they want to escape the, 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 the violence and the, the nonsense that's going on in some of these drug fueled communities. Not all of them, but the ones where the, where the parents aren't doing the right thing. But I am a member of the Australian Labor Party. I don't apologise for that. I wish that we could have some system that would go to, to taking away the pain that I feel and, and you would feel every time you go and others that see up there. There's a lot of work to be done. But the truth of the matter is the Labor Party took it to the election. And I will be voting with the Labor Party, with my party, on the abolition of the uh, cashless welfare card, cashless debit card. Um, I do have to say that um, Ian Trust, and I know Senator Reynolds mentioned in Ian Trust's name, Ian is a personal friend of mine. And I still work very closely with Ian. I was on the phone to him last week and through Woonan, and I admire the work that he's done. And I had a conversation with Ian just prior to Minister Rishworth going up there, and I heard Senator Reynolds say not a lot of consultation. Well, I know Senator Rishworth. Oh, no, sorry, Minister Rishworth was in Kununurra because I know she met up with Ian. She met up with the crew. She met up with everyone. Um, and Ian is one of the most wonderful people in the world. And I know that, first and foremost, are his people and his kids. And I know that he has some plans, so hopefully we can get together and we can try and mirror what's being done up in uh, Cape York. But the truth of the matter is um, it was taken to the election and the other side can bang on as much as they like. It wasn't a secret. I've done my best within the Labor Party to put my views forward and my view is in the, in, in the minority. So uh, Ian, I'll still continue to work with you, mate, and Lawford, and I hope the heck that we can do all we can to possibly achieve closing these gaps. We've been talking about it damn well long enough and we're nowhere near it. So on that, I will be supporting the bill that the government puts here into the Senate and voting for the abolition of the cashless welfare card. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Call Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, one of the things that is constantly on the, uh, on the minds of <coughs> South Australians and Australians that I speak to uh, as, I, uh, as I get around and speak to people is this issue of uh, data integrity and data security. It is consistently uh, a theme, a theme which is bothering people, a theme which is constantly on people's mind, and it's never been more important, I think, in, uh, uh, in our lives than it is today in 2022. Everybody uh, has data out there on the cloud with their service providers, government departments. Uh, it is a massive, massive issue for Australians, and it's not an issue, Mr Acting Deputy President, to be taken lightly, which I fear is uh, something we're seeing from the government in the last week. Um, it is extraordinary news, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we have seen uh, something in the order of, we, we think it may be now, as many as 10 million Australians, the data of 10 million Australians, uh, compromised uh, out of uh, uh, Optus users. Um, incredibly concerning stuff, but even more incredibly concerning that is the listless, listless approach from the government and the minister uh, responsible, who we heard uh, this afternoon took uh, something in the order of three days, I think it was, to even respond to, to the incident itself. Uh, and to be even more uh, frank about it, having, having taken three days to respond, the response formed three tweets. And three tweets, it's 333, uh, Mr. Deputy President, at three quarter time of the AFL grand final we heard today. Uh, extraordinary stuff. It was a relatively dull game, I get that. And if ever you were going to take the opportunity to get a press release out, 
it would be once you'd put down the Bollinger at the, uh, the half-time show at the AFL Grand Final, uh, bang out a couple of tweets and make sure the Australian people have full confidence uh, in that which you are doing in your portfolio. But of course, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't satisfy the likes uh, of me. It won't satisfy the likes of Australians who are hoping and pleading that their government is across this issue. Um, we heard from uh, the Leader of the Opposition on Friday, um, well before the grand final, I might say, that this may in fact be the largest ever data breach in Australian commercial history. Now, um, that was known well in advance of Saturday. I, I ask what the question, uh, what, what, what the delay was in responding and why it took so long. Uh, the opposition is now seeking briefings in relation to the matter, but the Albanese government seemingly has just been missing in action on this issue. And Australians deserve the opportunity to hear what steps the government is taking to secure their personal data and protect them from future cyber attacks, because of course this one incident might, might well be the tip of the iceberg. We, we don't know. Uh, what else is out there. We know that Australians live their lives now um, in the cyber world, and that is only going to increase. This issue is only going to get more important. And of course, with the prospect of digital ID and the digital ID legislation approaching, Australians have got every, every right to be concerned about uh, their data being in the hands of others, governments, private businesses, because we can see what can happen. Millions and millions of terabytes of data can go, maybe not that much, but terabytes of data can go. It's a lot. It's a lot. I'm quite tech savvy, as you know. Uh, uh, can, go, can go off into the ether without even blinking, uh, as it has in this instant. And really, the, um, uh, the, the businesses and the corporations need to be transparent, but that's what governments are for. Governments are meant to be there for the regulatory purposes of taking it up to businesses when they, when they have these sorts of problems. Uh, the government, including the cybersecurity minister, now needs to make good that delay, that listless response, and tell the Australian people uh, and make it clear what steps they've taken to protect Australians from future such attacks, because there will be more. We have um, bad actors in the corporate world. We've got state-based actors looking for opportunities to penetrate the uh, uh, cybersecurity veil. And um, we know that the coalition government, uh, as it was, had an extraordinary track record when it came to cybersecurity. In fact, some of the most uh, impressive and um, far-reaching deliveries in terms of key reforms. Uh, World-leading laws to protect critical infrastructure like water, power, telecommunications from sophisticated cyber attacks. Uh, we had introduced a suite of ransomware-related legislation, uh, which included tougher penalties for criminal provisions uh, to deter cyber criminals. Um, regulatory amendments to empower the telco sector to identify and block SMS scams, which are now becoming even more prevalent. Uh, we had. Uh, the expansion of a 24-hour cybersecurity centre hotline to ensure Australians, including business owners, had, had access to cybersecurity data. That's the point being here that time is of the essence with these, these matters. Uh, not three-quarter time, not full time, but time, Mr Acting Deputy President. Yes. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, and, uh, look, I, I have a lot of respect for Senator Antig on, on this particular matter, but uh, it, it is quite disappointing to see when the opposition comes here into the chamber, um, trying to play political football uh, uh, with the issues of such importance, such as what has occurred over the last week. And I appreciate that uh, Senator Antig appreciate the pun that was used there, but it is quite serious matter. It is a very serious matter. We've had 10 million people uh, records that have been breached, uh, but it is a breach, and it is a breach that Optus seriously needs to pay particular attention to and address with utmost urgency. And that is why the minister today and, and what we have heard from the opposition, apparently the minister has not made any public statements or, or tweets, because that's how they used to govern. Remember how they used to govern back when they were in government? Press releases, tweets, it was all spin but no substance. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. And as the minister also articulated very clearly today in question time, the adults are in charge. We don't need to be putting useless tweets or media releases out to the public. What we are doing, what we are doing is taking the advice of our experts, experts that actually understand all the technical ins and outs of what has actually occurred. Now, there is obviously national security implications here, things that we cannot disclose. But the minister will, at the appropriate time, make all the necessary commentary when she has all the facts in front of her. 
That is something that we and our agencies are trying to do right this moment, working with Optus, trying to understand how deep have the hacks uh, ha have occurred. But the minister today in question time has made it very clear, has made it very clear that responsibility for such breaches rests with Optus. And, and I quote, I want to note that the breach is of a nature that we should not expect to see in a large telecommunications provider in this country. So for, for uh, Senator Antic and others on the other side to come in here pretending that uh, somehow, oh, this is just a, an event that requires just a media release or a tweet, just solves all the issues of the world. Well, it doesn't. Actually, our public servants, those particularly in ASD, our signals directorate, the cyber security team here in Canberra, and the federal police have been working around the clock over the last four days. Whilst Senantic makes fun of people, um, and, and particularly those that may have actually been at the footy, but I can tell you there are a lot of public servants in this uh, great capital here that were working very hard, working very closely with Optus to make sure that those people who have actually hacked into the data um, the database of Optus are going to be held accountable. They are going to be held accountable and according to Australian law. And interestingly, the um, other aspect too that the minister has also highlighted in, in the parliament today is that one in four of our Commonwealth entities actually met the essential eight cybersecurity obligations back in 2021. Um, further, it is also now public record that when the Labor Party were in opposition, it took the then Liberal government last year 365 days to release a discussion paper calling for a ransomware strategy. They then introduced this bill, but it was too late. It was far too late to actually have the bill passed by, this, by the previous parliament because we had the upcoming federal election. And there would have been other remedies in that bill that would have prevented such hacks from occurring but the government of the day, the then coalition government, the Liberals and the Nationals, took their time in implementing reforms that were needed. Uh, but the minister today, Claire O'Neill, has also indicated that this hack has actually resulted in, in a need for substantial reform. Substantial reform that this government will be working very closely with the industry and others to ensure that this occurrence does not happen again. Uh, but Optus has said that it would directly communicate with those customers over the coming days. So I do encourage anyone who is a current customer of Optus or has been in the last seven years, please make sure you do contact Optus. Please make sure that you do ensure that they are actually taking this breach very seriously. Because the last thing that this government wants is people details being uh, shopped around out there. Because we all know, we've all been probably all know of people in our families who have been unfortunately caught up in some scams in the past. But it is something that this government is taking very seriously, despite the rhetoric that we hear from those opposite. But it's interesting because they've spent the last hour and a half, the hour and a half wasting precious Senate time so they could filibuster and prevent you, precious Senator. legislation from being okay. passed. Yeah. Call Senator Little. Thank you. Um, I came into this place on the 1st of July, so um, speaking in this is new to me. But certainly the cashless debit card, the basics card, and working in and with Aboriginal communities in remote and regional areas is definitely not. It's a career spanning some 25, almost 30 years, let alone being born in a place where the card actually exists and having immediate family still living in those places. It's disappointing that the government has misled the Australian public with promises during the election campaign and now embarrassingly having to admit that it was a grab for votes. This is a promise they should break. The amendments we have now seen allow Cape York, the CDC trials and those people in the NT who have voluntarily transitioned from the basics card onto the CDC to remain on the cashless debit card. This is just an admission that they have messed up this ill-conceived election commitment. The amendments put forward by the government confirms that even they admit that abolishing the cashless debit card will have serious consequences for vulnerable communities. We see that in the provision of 50 million for additional drug and alcohol support services because they themselves recognise the serious harm that is likely to result from the removal of this critical program. 
The Albanese government's decision to abolish the cashless debit card will give the green light to more alcohol, drug abuse and violence in some of our most vulnerable communities for the most vulnerable people within those communities. Addicts will now have more cash to access grog, gunja, crack and gambling. And families will have less chance to protect themselves because they will no longer have the card to be able to do that. Let me give you an example of how this works. These women who have these grandmothers who are looking after their children's children because they can't or won't see family walking down the street. When they see family walking down the street that with the cashless debit card and the basics card, they don't have to cross the street. What they can say to their family is, I'm sorry, I can't give you cash to go and buy grog, gunja and gamble because the card doesn't allow me to give you any more cash than the cash I have in my pocket. <laughs> That's about protecting their interests. That's about protecting the interests of their children. That's about protecting the interests of their grandchildren. That's about protecting the interests of other people who are not Indigenous that also live in the towns and communities. This is not a race issue. This is actually about people who are problem drinkers, who often find themselves incarcerated, incarcerated at risk of deaths in custody because they've been drunk, drugged, or they're just finding themselves on the street because their families will not let them live in their house because of the dysfunction that addiction brings. This is the reality. The CDC is an advanced technology that enables recipients to access their welfare payments using the universal banking platform. The Basics card is a limited delivery mechanism. I've heard people way back before 2016 and even when the card come in, came in, and I heard them say to me, I don't like being on the card, but you know what? It gives me protection from my family members. I've got money to feed the kids, I've got money to clothe them, and it makes life a whole less hectic. Only a few weeks ago when I went to Sejuna, I'll tell you what my consultation looks like. I actually had to go at the last minute. And sure, we, vis we visited those organisations that usually provide the services. But then Julian Lesser and I went for a walk down the street. We went into the gaming room. We went into the bar. We met people that we met on the street in places on the edge of the town because they were too frightened to speak to us directly. And what they said to us repeatedly was, I don't like the card. I shouldn't be on the card, but I know the card is really important for my family and I get power and I get control when I can tell people that I can't give them money because the money is quarantined on a card. That takes it out of the personal. That gives them the power and that gives them the power to feed their children and to clothe them. This is a terrible decision. Senator Little. Uh, the question is that the motion to take note of answers moved by Senator Reynolds be agreed to. All those of the opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Call the Greens. Deputy President, I rise uh, to take note of the answer given by Minister Gallagher to a question I asked today relating to paid parental <coughs> leave. 21 years ago, in 2001, I sat at the back of this chamber as a staffer near the senator who introduced Australia's first private member's paid parental leave bill. Senator Natasha Stott Despoja. At that time, Australian women were, alongside the US, the only women in the OECD not to get a paid rest when they had a baby, a hundred years after the International Labor Organization said they should. Anyone who has carried, pushed out, fed a new baby and been sleep deprived for months knows how essential that rest is. If Australian men had babies, we would probably lead the world on paid parental leave, just as we led the world on the eight hour day in 1856 and set a decent minimum wage at Federation. We were international leaders in creating a working man's paradise, a white working man's paradise, important to note, but that paradise did not extend to mothers. Sadly, it was not until 10 years after that first private member's bill that this parliament finally enacted paid parental leave in 2010, 
with leave of 18 weeks at a minimum wage. An additional two weeks was added later for partners on a use it or lose it basis. 11 years on, we've been overtaken by the rest of the OECD yet again, with the average period of paid parental leave now around 52 weeks in the OECD and close to full replacement wages in many places. Australia now has one of the poorest paid parental leave schemes in the OECD. We are now stuck at an inadequate 18 weeks paid leave with two weeks for partners at minimum wage without superannuation, a pay cut for so many people at a critical moment in a family's life. Today the Greens are pushing for a catch-up. We have given notice of a bill to be introduced in November to increase the length of paid parental leave to 26 weeks, to offer six weeks of paid parental leave to be available to second carers on a use it or lose it basis that leave to be paid at, the, at a minimum wage level as the lowest level of payment, with income replacement for those who earn more up to a wage cap of 100000 and superannuation to be paid on the full period of leave. Overseas evidence tells us that increasing the rate of pay for paid parental leave and making a portion of it available six weeks in our bill to second carers, mostly fathers in many Australian households, on a use it or lose it basis has a powerful positive effect for the longer term sharing of parenting. It's great for fathers, it's really important for kids, it's important for families and it will shift gender equity. It's also vital to include super. At present, new parents pay a big price in lost income, including superannuation, when they have a baby. We must ensure that mothers in particular do not find themselves living in poverty in old age after a lifetime of work and care. There's powerful evidence that improving paid parental leave like this will do many good things. It will increase women's participation in paid work. It'll address skill shortages. It'll increase GDP. It'll improve children's development and improve relationships between couples and between kids and their parents. It has a very positive effect on men's health and it will help address gender inequality. Those supporting increased paid parental leave, and they are many, know we can afford it. We can afford to increase the length of leave, the rate of payment, and we can pay superannuation on it. Rather than give a $9,000 tax cut to the very wealthy and each of the 227 politicians in this building, we can redirect stage three tax cuts to the parents and the kids who need it most. We should set aside these stage three tax cuts and instead improve paid parental leave and take other measures that will help Australian families deal with the cost of living crisis, including providing free, quality, accessible early childhood education and care. At the recent Jobs and Skills Summit, Australians and organisations from across the country, parents, women, unions, employers, were united in their call for a paid parental leave increase and improvement for Australia's parents, especially mothers. Indeed, the ACTU called for a pathway to 52 weeks leave, so we move ourselves more centrally to the OECD average. Alongside improved early childhood education and care, increasing paid parental leave was one of the most common and most united points of discussion at the summit. No one opposed it. It's time to act. We can afford it, and for the sake of our kids, parents, women and our workplaces and economy, it's time we did it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay, I now put the question uh, that the Senate take note of answers. Those with that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.